Let's uh, shift from Leonardo to Caravaggio. Maybe you want to pre- correct my pronunciation. Caravaggio. Well, the the first painting that I had in mind was Boy Bitten by a Lizard, which is a, is a fairly funny painting. But can you, again, I mean, you did this wonderfully for Virgin of the Rocks, give our our audio only listeners an idea of what's happening in the painting? Well, um, let me call it up so I just remember exactly what it looks like. Forgive the typing voices you're going to hear. Um, it's a, it's an illustration um, of a boy who's looking at a vase of flowers and probably not realizing that there was a lizard in the um, vase and it's it's nipped him on the finger. And so what this thing, I mean, it may have a kind of allegorical significance that's lost on me, but one of the things that, that's clearly what's going on is to try and demonstrate, it's a little bit art about art, I think. He's demonstrating a reaction, an effect, an, an effect and an emotional reaction, a facial expression, a movement. He's also showing you um, his ability to paint people, flesh, fabric, still life, flowers, you know, reflections, water, all that. It's a little bit, look what I can do. This is a guy trying to establish himself in his career. So all that's going on as well. So it is also meant to be not so serious, I think. You know, I may be wrong about that, but my view about that is it's also a little bit of fun to show, you know, it's almost like a visual joke, an owl. Um, but to capture that is is no small thing. Right, and I, my understanding is that I, I'm not a an artist, but that painting hands is one of the most difficult aspects of painting people. And there's a lot going on with these hands. So if this is meant to exhibit in some ways ability, this is a a good way to do it. And of course, the lizard biting the hand, that this is the title of the painting, though I don't know if he gave it this title, maybe not. Possibly Uh, not, no. Yeah, it it draws attention to the hands and the technique there. Hmm. I think the real intent was the reaction, the shock reaction, the facial expression, which, you know, again, in an era before um, cameras, you know, holding a transient feature like that and convincing it re- in a convincing realistic way is, is quite a demonstration. Right. And also, it would be quite difficult to ask a model to hold. I mean, a model couldn't really hold that, that facial expression. For one to paint yeah well that's one of the things with how much he used his own face and mirrors and things when he was starting in particular but yeah, the idea of models was complex and and the really interesting thing about him is the extent to which you know the thing that all his contemporaries wrote about was that he didn't do that elaborate renaissance idea of doing 15 drawings and working them up into a drawing you know he's kind of going for it on the canvas i mean drawing with the brush and then developing his ideas. Hmm. And I, I said that uh, maybe we would get back to layers, what's on top, what's on bottom when we got to Caravaggio. But you, you wrote that in one of, again, one of the articles I read that this painting had a dark brown ground that was useful for him as he composed the other elements of the painting. And maybe we could say explicitly what the what the ground is and then how it's used or the how is the priming it's the first color you put on the whole canvas like the background underneath you know when you buy a canvas in an art store now it's got a white ground hasn't it it's got a gesso a acrylic gesso on it or whatever so you'd say that's a white ground like an impressionist picture well in this period he's using these grounds which are actually if you have the picture in front of you um the kind of mid-tone shadow of his chest or of his scarf that is the ground doesn't have has very little paint on it so he's got that kind of i mean in in england you'd call it almost a biscuit color but i mean a kind of um um kind of middle brown kind of tawny brown color um sometimes darker sometimes lighter but there it is it's built in already uh, as a mid-tone in terms of value you know between light and dark and you don't have to do much, and particularly if you're painting flesh, to use that as your kind of shadow by 
So you paint light colors on top to bring things forward, and then you glaze something transparent and dark over that kind of ground color to create a shadow. And you can leave it more or less exposed in those transitions in the middle. And uh, it's a very effective way because when you paint light colors over dark colors, they get very opaque very quickly. So you can cover very efficiently. And it's a fast way to paint, faster than glazing light over dark over and over and over and over. Um, I mean, dark over light over and over and over, uh, like a white ground. So a darker ground allows you to, to, to do more work more quickly, too. Hmm. And is it the the darker paints that you said were oil based? I think it's all walnut oil based. Oil. Yeah. Uh, but then so so then where does the egg come in? Just for the lighter colors? Oh, with Caravaggio, well, we have this idea that you know, at least we thought some years ago that he might have done that. That really is not central to his painting technique at all. But sometimes there's a belief that some of the fine, fine white highlights on top of white, like if you're doing threads of embroidery on a tablecloth, on a white tablecloth, it's all oil paint, but maybe just to get that little slightly raised pure white tiny highlights, he might have used different media. But he is painting an oil paint, you know, for the overwhelming majority of what he's doing. There's not much crazy experimentation going on. The revolutionary thing about him was that everyone remarked upon was, um, you know, painting from live models, not making drawings and painting directly on the canvas. Mm. Well, I think that the, the next painting that we'll get to, uh, is one where these models really come to the fore. But before we move to that one, I'm guessing you've seen Tim's Vermeer. Tim's Vermeer. Yeah. The documentary. No, I don't think I have that. Somebody recreates a, a Vermeer painting, Tim, uh, incidentally. Okay, so I think it was produced by Penn or Teller or one of them. But anyway, before I had seen this, I didn't realize, it just hadn't ever occurred to me that, oh, yeah, artists once had to make their own paint. And you couldn't just go to a store and buy your paint. And it was a serious skill. I mean, you had to collect all sorts of things to make paint, but... So was Caravaggio making all of these paints himself in his studio and to get the, the the precise sort of colors or qualities that he was hoping to get? Well, possibly, yeah. I mean, you know, that's the sort of thing also that you, that's what apprentices do. You know, if you look at, it's, it's, it's not that, I don't think Caravaggio would be grinding his, you know, his red color, but he certainly, somebody would have ground it for sure. Um but, you know, there isn't this, it's, the thing that makes the Caravaggio great is not some secret formula that he did with his red pigment that no one else did. Or, you know, it's just the, the materials in Caravaggio are very standard across anybody painting in Rome in 1600. There will be a brown ground and there's about five colors. You know, there's white, black, yellow, red, um, tiny bit of blue, but it's really expensive. You know, they're all using the same stuff. Um so yeah, it's true. Of course, a lot of the stuff had to be handmade, um, pigments ground. Um, they would have had preferences about what kind of paint they liked, but it wasn't so. That's not really where the where the revolution lies with him. It's about an attitude to um, painting from live models. Mm -hmm. Yes, my my question wasn't really about Caravaggio in particular, but just more a curiosity about how paint how paint was made. And source. Yeah, definitely. Well, there's, there's all sorts of recipes and understanding about how to grind your colors and what to do. And yeah, it, it, it had to be done in every studio. You start getting color men who will provide you prime canvases in the 17th century. But uh, yeah, typically it's the, the youngest apprentices who are going to be doing all that kind of donkey work of grinding. Um, you know, not much fun. But yeah. Well, the, the next painting of his that I wanted to talk about was the the Supper at Emmaus. Emma, yeah. <laughs> and I just, I pulled it up. Uh, and this is one, I mean, maybe you could describe it again, but this is one where I think models were, were used heavily. Yeah, but the interesting thing here also, yeah, we, we can even see some of the same people in different pictures by him. Um, but 
even there, it's pretty unlikely that he got, you know, four people to sit around the table. He might have done, but he might have you know, made a collage of individually posed models. Um, but yeah, the whole immediacy of this is slightly unusual, Caravaggio, because he's painting it for, or to, for a, a very prestigious client. And so it's very high, it's unusually highly carefully finished for him. Um, but again, it's this interest in, in reaction and gesture and immediacy and, you know, this strong, almost exaggerated, well, it is exaggerated perspective of the arm coming out at you or, or, um, the figure in the lower left is actually meant to be, you know, pushing his chair back from the table, like as if he's going to fall out of the canvas into your space. Remember, these are effectively life-size figures too. Yeah. Now, why would this prestigious uh, or eminent client commission a painting of four people sitting at a table over a, a meal from Caravaggio? Why, why, why would that be of interest rather than a, por a, a portrait of the, the client or some well, religious this is a kind of history painting, which was seen as, you know, telling a narrative through the language of more than one figure is the most lofty kind of painting because it's the most ambitious, difficult thing to do. This is not just four blokes sitting around the table. This is the moment in which they, they realize who he is. And that's why they're looking astounded. Um, and it's possibly the innkeeper doesn't realize, but the apostles do. Uh, and so this is a huge uh, moment of drama realized through psychologically loaded uh, gestures and reactions, uh, all done with a naturalism that was astounding for its time, like the way that basket um, is sitting over the, precariously over the front edge of the table, again, like it might fall into your space. So you're having all these things going on that look incredibly naturalistic, and yet there's a huge amount of planning and um, consideration about um, reaction. But even they're also very carefully things that it takes a lot of thinking to make something look completely um, spontaneous. Look at those shapes of the shadow in the background, or you know there are, there are lots of things that people write about um, significance of some of these things. But you know, in addition to the drama, it's it's the idea that this biblical story is made tangible and real by doing it in the language, the visual language of people living at that time, you know, the kind of chair, what they're wearing, the tableware, all that is, is um, uh, quite extraordinary in that it is everyday stuff. Although paradoxically, the decision to do this is a very kind of elite and learned decision. Hmm. Yeah, I had not. I, I embarrassingly hadn't realized that this was a biblical image. No, or that that's that Christ. Was... It's when the disciples realize he's the risen Christ, and it's like, oh, they're they're, they're reacting very strongly. It's not just some guys. Okay. And when you say this painting was very carefully finished, is that with reference to two things like the shadows or? Uh, the ruffles in their clothing or the shell on the rightmost figure. Just how far he took the, you know, painting where threads on the seam or how, uh, individual hairs on beards. And he's normally a little bit broader in his execution. I mean, over like many artists, he gets looser as he, as his career progresses. But this particular work is very highly finished for the specific, specific circumstances of its commission. And in the case of this painting in particular, how does or how did analyzing the paint show you the way in which the painting was set up or the order in which it was accomplished or even the way Caravaggio's thinking might have evolved as he painted it? Well, the fact that there's not much, um, let's say, for example, that the this, the table, the white tablecloth is painted mostly around the elements on the still life, which tells you that he drew it. He drew that still life on the, on the ground with the brown paint, you know, it's a, it was pretty carefully laid out because otherwise you might think, well, I'll paint the tablecloth and then paint the stuff on it. So no, everywhere we look, we don't see 
overlaps of you know that Christ's raised hand is is not painted on top of the finished shoulder of the innkeeper standing behind him. You know they're painted sort of worked up together after the, the brush drawing is put on the canvas. And the only real change we see is that the guy sitting on the right, his near leg used to be in front of the table, and he decided to paint that carpet tablecloth over his leg, pushing him back. And that's interesting to think about because that's something you could imagine he did that because um, by pushing the rest of him back, it may- makes that hand stretching out into your space even more dramatic. And it also means that the guy on the left, who's almost literally falling out of the picture, is is out on his own in a plane where there's nothing else. So those kinds of things you, know, you can work out by looking at x-rays and say, well, this is a very, very carefully planned picture. And isn't it interesting that the one thing we see that's a kind of fundamental change that happened after he got well into the composition, you can see how it enhanced the drama. Hmm. Now, as I look at that hand that's stretching out toward me, I imagine it would be m- much easier to learn how to do this if you had Maybe if you had a picture that you could look at rather than a model, just because the picture already gives you a, a two-dimensional representation of the perspective. But how did would somebody like Caravaggio have have learned how to paint with this perspective? Was he already just like a very skilled draftsman and would spend or had spent a lot of time just drawing images like this to get it correct before he started painting like this? Well, it depends what you mean by drawing. I mean, that is the great critical question about Caravaggio. There's a very famous article in the history of art history saying, did Caravaggio draw? Because, there, you know, there aren't drawings. There aren't bits of, you know, someone like uh, Anibale Caracci, his great uh, contemporary and um, you might say rival, but that's not right. Anyway, um, he was uh, someone who, of whom there are hundreds of beautiful drawings, figure studies, arm studies, uh, compositional studies have come down to us. There there are none from Caravaggio. And that was part of the polemic is that he didn't believe in all that preparatory work, but clearly he knew how to draw. And he drew the brush. He must have had a very rigorous training. But the idea of preparatory separate studies uh, put together to work up a composition in the kind of classical way is just not something that he did. It's funny that I accidentally stumbled upon one of the <laughs> most important uh, art historical questions about um, Caravaggio. But yeah, well, you know, he just he, that, that's we... part of the polemic that you know a lot of people. What's good about him is what's bad about him. People think, oh, it's so naturalistic, and other people of his contemporaries would say, oh, it's so you know, it's 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 almost vulgar. It's 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 rough. It's not properly abstract and idealized. Uh, and weirdly, it's that kind of idea that the naturalism is actually the kind of elite progressive idea, <laughs> at least amongst his circle of patrons in Rome. So it's not as much of a, a reverie as the first painting we looked at, the Virgin of the Rocks. Certainly not. But the great the great comparator for him, as I say, is Anibale Caracci, who's more like a Baroque uh, Raphael, where there's an idea and abs- abstract idea about you know, beauty being important in a picture and beauty being idealizing figures and thinking about color relationships almost independently you know, making beautiful balanced colors across the composition and uh, a kind of distillation into an idealized world um, which is not what Caravaggio was interested in showing you did Caravaggio, I don't know if this is the right, is the actual title of the painting, um, the card sharps, or did he paint that? Yeah, he painted a couple of versions of that. Okay, it's interesting. I mean, they're very similar. It's a very similar painting to this in terms of the composition or the angle, the the ground. I mean, it's just something that's coming to yeah, mind. Yeah, half-length be... figures around the table, action, drama, for sure. But, you know, just yeah. not as lofty a subject. Right. Well, shall we turn to the the third of the paintings of Caravaggio I wanted to talk about? Is it 
Salome or Salome with the head of John the Baptist? Well, however you like. I would say Salome, but that's maybe that's English way of saying it, Salome. Yeah. This is a late picture, possibly one of the last things he painted. And already you can see in this work that um, in keeping with what happened to him is that his palette became uh, very restricted. The grounds are a bit darker than not many colors. The drama is emphatic and the finish is loose. Um, but even that, you know, again, we can't, we got to resist trying to um, over egg the modernity of that because he also did some things that made it look, uh, you know, quite carefully did some things th to make it look more spontaneous than it is too. So, but this is him paring down, you know, all the constituent elements of his painting to something that um, is very powerful because it's very expressive because it is just that it's, it's, it feels like nothing can be added that would not make it worse. Mm. Well, something conservation related to this question in particular is I understand that there were a number of incisions on it when you looked at it. So where would these incisions have come from and how no, that, that's, are This again is one of those things where the conservator can help enter the discussion because if the, cre if the key critical thing about Caravaggio is if he painted using live models, you know, how did he do that? And one of the things that people have worked out is that while the ground, the priming layers are still fairly um, soft and malleable, he might actually scratch some crude kind of place markers in the canvas to help him really to help him repose models on the same pose. So he's kind of drawing with the stick in in the canvas, but not drawing in a way that, um, as you would understand that you know, making a form, but he might do a little squiggle where the elbow was. So that when the model came back, it was like, you would know the elbow there. So that the pattern of, of um, incisions is often just a little contour where the elbow is, where an ear was. So we get the tilt of the head exactly right, just so you could resume the pose. So he seems to have made people used incisions in paintings, generally with rulers to help lay out Renaissance perspectives or, but he's doing it in a dynamic way, which is all, in the service of the things people were writing about him during his lifetime, which was this, you know, painting from life. So as a conservator trying to unpick what's going on, you know, not me, but many people before me looking at those things, looking at X radiographs and seeing what are these scratches and what function did they serve? It all starts to coalesce. And again, that's the, the joy of our work is that it happens because of us, um, interacting with, um, speaking, reading, understanding that the art historical discussions around what he's about. So there seems to be a way he evolved to kind of put markers, little daubs of white paint to suggest where the hinge of a hip might be, some scratches around, you know, an elbow or an ear or a shoulder, just to help that model come back and get the same lean and get it exactly how we wanted. Um, so that's going on in this picture. It's nothing like a comprehensive drawing at all. Some of them have almost nothing. Yeah, you know, maybe one knee is scratched in the canvas, like a, and others have got a lot of incisions. One of the most interesting things to me when I was reading one of your article on this painting was that he would draw the ears first in this same. Well, this is one the theory as well that a guy called Tommaso Schneider came up with. And not even drawing them, but he would just put some two red strokes again so you know how the head would go. Not like this, but like this. Um, just to place the head. So again, it's there's a little system of putting the ears placers in the right place, doing some contours and a bit of white highlights here and there to help resume the pose and then start painting. Mm. But... With regard to St. John the Baptist's head first, I mean, he drew the, he, I think he had the ear more or less, and correct me if I'm wrong, more or less completely painted. And then he put the hair, he painted the hair over it. And I this is something that you could paint it, but he had it suggested. He had that red stroke, like this is where it is. Yeah, definitely. 
Right. And this this helps ensure that everything's going to be symmetrical. But it's interesting that it's like well, not even symmetrical, the- just that he knows the relationship of that head and where it sits with the other heads and they're all placed in the right relationship and it's consistent in different sessions of posing. I mean that's the theory. No one no one can ask him, but that's kind of the our working knowledge of how those things work. They're just in the service of him painting from life, which is the that's the headline. Is um even if you had to get four different people holding poses at four different times, but the idea that each one is observed, the way the light falls, the drapery, all those things, is right. based on life observations painted directly on the canvas. So you, that aside, you don't see it as also in the spirit of ensuring that the head really looks like a head by getting the ears in there first, even if he paints over them and ensures that there's, okay. No, I don't think that. I mean, I think you know, he, he makes things look the way he wants them to look everywhere. But I think these these little strokes around the ear and the incisions are m- most people understand them as placement. And those red strokes generally are covered with more subtle, um, sophisticated and accurate uh, modeling and color renderings. They're nearly always underneath something you see. Were there any other particular features of this painting that required special care in conserving it. I imagine that the serious contrast between the light and the dark colors might raise a special consideration. But I mean, that, that, that these kind of pictures pose all sorts of problems for photographers photographing them. They're very, very hard to photograph, but uh, no, in terms of, I mean, the issue is that I think, um, some of that thick, bright colored paint, you know, is, maintains a hue and intensity that some of the darker tones, the differences between them are harder. They're more vulnerable to historic damage. So they required a bit more retouching in some areas than others. But um, no, not really. I mean, from that point of view, it's very, technically, it's not complex what it's doing. It's, it's the concept it is. Mm. And just a, a, uh, a, uh, a question about what we're supposed to see. Are these maybe like smudges on the executioner's hands, these sort of reddish browns? Are those meant to indicate blood from the execution? Just a second. I'm going to pull it up and make sure we're on the side of the run. Um, on his hands. So like around the thumbnail, for instance, or the, the hand that's the knuckles of the hand that's holding the sword. Or are those just shadows? They're just shadows. But that, I mean, the interesting thing there is that those shadows are in this kind of, you know, chocolate brown um, color. Uh, and they're meant to look like he's left the ground showing through. But in fact, he's added them at the end to make the picture, in my view, I mean, not everyone agrees with that, but I think he's doing things deliberately at the end to make it look more spontaneous. He's carefully considering how to make it look um, spontaneous in certain areas because the rhetoric around finish and painting from the life was such that that the look of something that was done fairly effortlessly leaving the ground exposed was something that interested him. 